tremendous storms down through history. And I was reading an article, the National Hurricane Service is predicting that this season could be the producer of many devastating storms. But there is a storm on the horizon like none other. And Jesus said that the tribulation period would be a time like none other. There's never been a time like it. And that's ahead. And you and I will need to rejoice in the fact that we're saved, we'll be saved from that storm. We'll be kept from that hour. We'll go up at the rapture before, not in the middle way point of the tribulation period, not at the end of it. There are those that say there are no millennium, but you study your Bible carefully and you'll see that the rapture, the pre-tribulation rapture fits the Bible. Turn your Bible to Revelation chapter 13. If you did not receive an outline when you came in, raise your hand and our men will see to it that you receive one. We've come to chapter 13, the midway point of the tribulation period. Chapter 13 introduces two men. They are men, but they have beast-like qualities. Their character is beast-like. Not just like any man, though, these men, you could take Hitler and Mussolini and Mao and name all of the awful leaders and put them into one Nero, and that's what you have in these two men, the Antichrist and the false prophet. The Antichrist is seen first in chapter 13, verse 1, where he rises from the raging nations, and then the second beast comes on the scene who gives his allegiance to the first beast. And we'll see in just a moment that both of them are energized by the dragon or the devil. So you have an unholy trinity. The dragon, who is Satan, and of course we know that everything the devil does, he copies God. And so the dragon would be the opposite of the father. The antichrist would be the opposite of the son. And the false prophet would be the opposite of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we see that coming in chapter 13. We'll probably have to spend several Sunday evenings in chapter 13 because there's so much here. But let's begin reading in verse 1 of chapter 13. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet was the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months." And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Let me pause. Do you have an ear for prophecy? Do you have an ear for the things of God? Are you listening? Many are not. 
Many believers are not. In the last days, Paul said, the love of many will wax cold. And in the last days, there will not be but a few that will have an ear for prophecy. If you have an ear, the Spirit of God says through the Word of God, I will teach you some things to prepare you for those last days, and you'll have an understanding of how to live victoriously during those days. Look at verse 10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity, and he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. He exerciseth all power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. There are those that say the second beast is the Antichrist, but that doesn't fit because this beast gives all allegiance to the first beast. And if you'll remember when Jesus was up on earth, he was totally in submission to the Heavenly Father. And so this beast would be in total submission to Christ or to the Antichrist, the Antichrist being to total submission to the dragon. Verse 12, And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him. He causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so they maketh fire to come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwelleth upon the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Notice the uses of the word image several times. That's very important to the understanding of this chapter. It's uh, important to understand man and his depravity. All the way back to the book of Genesis, man has an image or an imagination to be worshipped, to be his own God. And you can trace the word image or imagination from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation and how this beast will use that to his advantage so that the world will worship his image and will cause people to think, you don't need God, you can solve your own problems, you have the answers to your own situation because you're in your own image not in the image of God. And we'll look at that a little later when we get to it. Verse 16, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in the right hand or in their foreheads. In the hand, because those who receive the mark must give all of their physical energy to the devil to the beast. You must be totally, physically surrendered to the beast in order to buy and sell, in, oper in order to operate, in or 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 opportunity to move around. And so in the hand, so that it signifies the fact that I have given myself bodily, totally to the Antichrist. Then he said, in the forehead. These people will be called upon to give their total intelligence, understanding, not everything that they have. So physically, intellectually, these people must give everything that they have to the Antichrist. Now, I personally believe that this mark will be invisible. And I believe that the people who receive it will just simply uh, have to use their hand or their forehead to some machine or whatever, some laser to scan the number to introduce the fact that they have given 
their body over to the devil, their mind over to the devil. Verse 17, And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is six hundred, three score, and six. We know that God's number is seven. And so you have Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You have man who comes up short as far as God is concerned. And we'll get into that a little bit later on. I want you to think about America when the rapture takes place. In this country at this moment, there are missionaries supported from churches all around the world. When something evil is introduced into Congress or the Senate or whatever, there are Christians who stand up against it. We have the Christian Law Association. We have preachers who stand up and fight against it. And so in America right now, we have the Holy Spirit of God working in and through the lives of believers, working in and through the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to present the gospel to America and around the world. But the rapture takes place. Every believer is taken out. Now there is no one. There is no one to defend Israel. There is no one to stand up against all the evil and the wickedness that's going on in the world. And so the Antichrist will pretty much have free reign. The dragon will pretty much have free reign. And I personally believe that America will just simply fall in line with Europe and will fall right in with a one world government and become a part of it. America, the country that is the size of America and the power of America politically, economically, militarily, I don't think that you defeat that from without. I do not think that there's a country that would blow this country up to oblivion. And so you really don't see America in prophecy in the last days, either in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Why is that? Well, what country did we spring from? England. And the Bible has something to say about that country and Russia and Egypt and Syria and so forth. I personally think that we'll just simply blend in with all of it and become a part of it. I said Wednesday night, and you check this out. There are places now in America, Yellowstone National Park, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, Ellis Island, and on and on, that are under the auspices and control of the UN. Did you know that UN forces are being trained on the soil of the United States? And did you know that we have officers, high-ranking officers in this country, in our military, that fall in line and give allegiance to the UN? Things are falling in place for the Antichrist, for the beast to take over. Now go back to the book of Daniel chapter 8. And if you don't think that these days are days like no other, listen to what Daniel said hundreds of years ago about these events that would take place in the future. In the book of Revelation, John is picked up and is carried into the future and is able to see events that takes place in the future. Hundreds of years ago, Daniel 
was given visions of these last days. And watch what Daniel says about these days that are coming. Look at verse 23. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full. The word transgressors is rebels. There will come a day when rebels will have their way. They will have their way in this country. They will have their way in the world. We're fighting right now all kinds of battles. Dr. Cyphers and I were talking to Dr. David Gibbs the other evening at, at lunch or at, at supper. And we were asking him questions concerning our church and concerning our school and what we should do to be prepared as far as our constitution and bylaws are concerned. How can we make these things better? And he began to talk about how lawyers just love to find a church like ours that is debt free, that owns property. They would love to come in and have some kind of a lawsuit, a homosexual come in and try to get a job here or whatever. And he said, these lawyers are so well trained that they will find any kink in your armor. They'll try to find any little thing that they can because if they can win the battle, then they can get land and sell the land and all the rest of it. We think that's bad now, but how bad is it going to be when this time takes place? When these rebels are in charge. Now read on. The transgressors are come to the full. A king of a fierce countenance and understanding. In other words, he is strong, he is mighty, he is a man that is very prudent, who knows how to go about getting the attention of people, gaining the loyalty of people. He has a great discerning spirit and attitude toward it. He knows how to manipulate people. People. He knows how to manipulate the world. He knows how to manipulate the leaders. And so he says, This king of a fierce countenance and understanding and dark sentences shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. We already saw that in Revelation, haven't we? how that the power and authority of the Antichrist is given to him by none other than the dragon, the devil himself. And he shall destroy wonderfully. That is, he will bring great ruin to things that have been set up that is right and correct and holy. And he will bring great, bring great ruin to the world and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. We're going to get to that eventually as to why God will allow that and what He will allow during that time. But please keep in mind, God has, is allowing it. He could, the devil could do nothing apart from God allowing it. And there's a reason for that. Our sovereign God is allowing this to happen, even the holy people. Verse 25, And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in the land. And he shall magnify, he will become very important in his own eyesight and in the sight of others. He shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken without hand. And the vision of the evening and of the morning which was told is true. Wherefore shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. Now watch. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward I rose up and did the king's business 
And I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. Can you imagine a man of Daniel's character and understanding? He was a man that purposed in his heart that he would not eat the king's meat. He was a man of quality and character. And yet when he saw this vision, it made him sick. If that astonished Daniel, what's it going to do to the people of this world when they see it taking place? Now I want you to think with me. It is quite possible, very possible, that the Antichrist is alive on the earth right now. Now you and I will not recognize him. And here's a reason for that. I think he is behind the scenes, if he is alive now, and I don't know that, but he could be, behind the scenes, quietly, with political power, putting his power and in place, getting ready. Here's the reason I say that. Turn to Revelation chapter 1. And if you've been with us in our study, I think you already understand this, but let's go back again and make the point before we move on. In Revelation chapter 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. The word shortly is with speed. So when the rapture takes place, things are going to escalate. They're going to move at a rapid pace. And we pointed out the matter of the temple and so forth. But the Antichrist who has been behind the scenes, kept hidden behind the scenes, will automatically come on the scene and quickly will begin to set up his rule. Now look at chapter 6. We've also looked at this, but go to chapter 6 once again if you will. Keep in mind, Revelation is in three sections. Chapter 1, John's vision of the risen Christ. Chapter 2 and 3, the church age from Pentecost until the rapture of the church. Chapter 4 and chapter 5, the scene is in heaven. And then we come back to earth in chapter 6. So look at chapter 6, verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and as I heard as it were the noise of thunder, there's coming judgment. One of the four beasts saying, come and see, or literally be going. And I saw and beheld a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. He will take up his power peaceably and quietly at first. He will make a pact, a covenant with the nation of Israel for seven years. Now in chapter 13, of course, he breaks that covenant. But he makes that covenant with the nation of Israel. He sets himself up as a peacemaker. He has all of the answers. He is a man who is energized by the devil. He has the intelligence of Satan. Can you imagine now, think with me. Here is a man who gets all of his energy, all of his intelligence from the devil. The devil has had six to 7,000 years of experience dealing with man. The devil knows man inside and out. Now I've said before and I say again, the devil cannot read our minds, but he does have the ability to put or to cast or to throw thoughts and imaginations in our minds. And so here is a man totally committed to the devil. And everything that he does is energized by Satan. Satan is now giving him his intelligence, his direction. Every move that he makes is energized by the devil, but he comes on the scene peaceably. His power, his scheme is in place for three and a half years, and we'll discuss that a little later on. But then he breaks his covenant with the Jews, 
at the midway point. Now, go back to chapter 13 with me, as you, if you will. I want us to look at the devil as we see him here in chapter 13. I want us to look at man as we see him in chapter 13. I want us to look at the Antichrist as we see him here. And we'll only get a little bit down the way tonight, and we'll spend more time with this next week. I want you to notice that what is happening here during the events of chapter 13. First of all, as to Satan. Now look at chapter 12, verse 3. We've already studied chapter 12, but I want you to see these verses. Chapter 12, verse 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads, tremendous intelligence, ten horns, great power, and seven crowns, authority, upon his heads. And then, of course, it tells about the army that is under him. And you look at verse 4. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, who we know as Israel, and to defy her child, who is Jesus Christ, as soon as it was born. Verse 7. And war was in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against the angels. Verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. Isn't that amazing? Hitler was able to deceive Germany. Mussolini was a great deceiver. Mao Zedong was a great deceiver, but these, and these men had great power. Saddam Hussein. But here's a man that's going to control the whole world. Here's a man that's going to deceive the whole world. The devil through the Antichrist. He deceiveth the whole world. Now watch. He was cast out of the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Look at verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast under the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. Look at verse 16. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood with the dragon and cast out of his mouth. Here's what we're saying. Satan is now in place. Everything is in place for him to unleash his awful plan for the last days. He's always wanted to be worshipped. He's always wanted man to bow down to him. He has always wanted the worship that belongs to God. And now God is going to allow him to have it for a short time. Now let me pause here and say something. I believe the Scripture is very plain on this. There will be people saved during the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. For out of it comes a number that no man can number. Most of them will be killed. They will be martyred. I sure am glad I won't be here. Aren't you glad you won't be here? I have a tough enough time with the devil right now. I have a tough enough time with myself right now. But can you imagine living in that day where you work all day long to buy one loaf of bread and the rich get richer and the poor get poorer and now here comes the devil on the scene and he is ready now to unleash the plan that he's had in place up on the earth. You see in chapter 13 his hatred toward the saints. The devil has always hated the saints. But here is his opportunity to unleash all kinds of persecution and turmoil. He unleashes his hate upon these saints that are alive during the tribulation period. But apparently the greater the persecution, the greater patience that the saints have. 
And you've noticed down through history that the Christians are at their best when things are worse. We're not very good in prosperity. Let's just, let's just look at it honestly. When things are good, we Christians are just not very good. We're not at our best. But we're at our best when things are at their worst. And apparently that's what happens here. Even though most of these believers are killed, they're at their best. They exercise the patience of the saints. And they're martyred. And of course, they will be rewarded. Here is Satan's rage for being cast out of heaven. He has always wanted to take the place of God. He has always wanted to have his way. If we have to deal with him now and to deal with this attitude and spirit now, what will the saints have to deal with then? His ambition to be worshipped. And through this image that's going to be set up during that time, the whole world will worship the image of the beast and through that the devil receives the worship that he's always wanted. And you see his copying of God's plan. I have a lot more I want to say tonight, and I'd really like to get into the rest of it, but I think because of time we'll pause here and we'll take up here, God willing, next week. If you haven't studied chapter 13 carefully, please do so. And we'll get into the idea of each of the beasts a little more carefully and closely. We'll begin to look at the nations that seem to be at the control or under the control of the Antichrist uh, during the last days. We'll probably try to take a little bit more look at the U.S. and so forth. We'll look at the image. We'll look at the mark of the beast. We'll look at the number 666, and we'll look at all of these. In closing, let me call your attention again to verse 16. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Remember, these people are asked to give the strength of their body and the allegiance of their mind to the devil. It won't be very hard, I don't think, for them to do that. Look around you today. Men don't like to retain God in their knowledge. We don't want to have to say that Jesus is the only way to heaven. I went through my mail last Tuesday and there was a letter there that did not have a postmark on it. Didn't have a name on it. But it was a thick letter. And I opened it up, and it was a letter from a doctor in, he said he was in Texas, and he wanted the truth to be known to preachers like me how to get to heaven. And he said in his letter, the Virgin Mary has appeared at least ten times. And in order to get to heaven, we had to worship the Virgin Mary because she will go to Jesus and Jesus will listen to her because she is his mother. I read that statement about one more and I put it in file 13. I know why he didn't want me to write him back because he knew many of us preachers would write back. The devil is shrewd. He is a deceiver. Men of intelligence, he's able to deceive them. I sure am glad for churches like this and people like you who've listened to the Word of God and will not allow the devil to deceive them. Let's keep preaching the truth until Jesus comes. Amen? And then one day we'll be with him up there when we watch these events take place. Let's stand and we'll be dismissed in prayer.